can i have your attention please i don't know can you project it so the objective is to have an overview of the different imaging modalities which we have now which one to use when and uh, which one is most useful at a given point of time so we'll have the first speaker the president of vrsi dr shobhit chawla he'll be talking on oct in macular diseases this is with the perspective of a comprehensive ophthalmologist so is it still a workhorse for most of us it is optical coherence tomography is a quick non invasive and reproducible imaging tool for macular lesions and has become an essential part of retina practice it is indeed an important part of cataract practice too today low acquisition time non invasive very sick patients can also have an investigation of macula even patients who have had a stroke and other debilitating a busy retina practice it helps in the future investigative direction to take you have a suspected cnvm see a large pd bumpy rp we immediately think of icg in our country if there is non response to conventional anti vegf therapy then also we think a patient who had undergone about seven eccentrics before he came to me and we saw this configuration on uh, oct and a bumpy rp and of retina which was not very edematous and there's a large branching vascular network sitting there which you see here on icg similar another patient with non response to conventional anti vegf therapy we saw this thumb like lesion on uh, and a pd we immediately thought and we picked up a polyp on icg so it gives a future in and correct anti vegf therapy was much better a patient with blood at varying levels again on oct scanning we subjected him to angiography and there is a retinal macro aneurysm sitting there so in cataract it's important as to what lurks beneath a patient comes in for cataract surgery i did have a feeling that the when the vision doesn't correlate so on on my 90d exam i suspected vitreo macular traction and there it is sitting so this patient will not benefit alone with cataract surgery but with a combined procedure another lamellar hole with an epiretinal membrane uh, like configuration or just an epiretinal membrane you can call it again a patient for combined surgery this lady came with diminution of vision and uh, before she came to me my fellow ha had got this oct done when i saw her i immediately ordered an angio because of this lesion and uh, two ocular oncologists of the country are still debating whether it's a hemangioma or a melanoma the features were a little confusing even on ultrasonography another patient only eye myopic patient i had treated her for myopic cnvm in the other eye in which she had come rather late so she just had 660 vision in that eye came with this sudden acute loss of vision in the left eye came for a cataract surgery again and we picked up this macular hole and this is just 4 days post op uh we did a combined cataract with the uh, macular hole surgery for her so it was an acute onset myopic macular hole a patient myopic patient with recent decrease of vision and not much progression of the cataract comes in and many times you are not able to because of the corio retinal atrophy pick up this fovio myopic traction maculopathy that well the fovio schisis which we call again she becomes a candidate for a combined procedure because the cataract takes care of the refractive correction and the uh, ilm peel with flapping takes care of her 
skisis. So it's a, a really good w a screening tool. All of us get diabetics who require cataract surgery. So it helps us in diagnosing macular edema, especially the SLO-based systems, even through the cataract. Decide on anti-VEGF before taking up for cataract surgery or if or in conjunction with it as necessary as the patient's condition is and as the patient's logistics work up and also for follow-up care in the patient. Patient has had PRP, has nucleus sclerosis grade 2 plus and macular edema. I would do cataract surgery along with anti-VEGF in this patient or pre-treat him if he has the time otherwise just go. You also pick up other markers like some amount of drill and hyperreflective particles. So this uh, dots which I, uh, HRDs which I subjected this patient to a, a dexamethasone implant along with cataract surgery. Persistent edema on OCT despite therapy. Uh, go ahead always as, Raja, uh, as uh, Anand will tell you, FFA and where indicated ICG should be done. Look for non-perfusion. This patient, see, as in another course, Raja, Dr. Raja had yesterday pound, pointed out, it's important to see all the cuts. This patient had persisted in edema, had received anti-VEGF therapy, thinking it's a branch retinal vein occlusion. I suspected something more because the pattern was not there, and on ICG, we picked up these polyps away from the fovea. So we treated him with anti-VEGF therapy and with some direct laser to these polyps. So OCT reveals the microanatomy of all the retinal layers and ena enables us to make the decision to follow up or to perform a peel for the ERM in ERM cases. And it clearly shows all the traction, it even gives us guidance as to where to start our peel from. Persistence of macular edema after anti-VEGF therapy in a case of CRVO, we go ahead with angiography and pick up the non-perfused areas and we, along in conjunction with anti-VEGF therapy, add in pan-retinal photocoagulation to the non-perfused areas. This patient looked clinically to have this choreo-retinal, uh, to the, have this RP atrophy temporal to the fovea, as we see, but did not have the feet features of true PFT on uh, uh, OCT. We did an angiography and we picked up a membrane. We also went ahead and did a OCT angiography and after treatment she has done well. Just required two anti-VEGF injections. So OCT is a non-invasive, quick and reproducible investigation that has revolutionize the imaging of posterior segment lesions. Correlation of individual layers involved on OCT with histopathology has brought us much closer to an accurate tissue diagnosis than ever before. Various combinations of findings on OCT in comparison with known OCT-based biomarkers have made disease identification and prostatification much simpler. OCT stills wear much of the de decision-making burden in the OPD, making it the enduring workhorse. Thank you once again for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Shobit Chawla. So, yeah, sure. So in essence, uh, what he has conveyed is one important point is uh, if you have a cataract and uh, patient and the vision is not correlating with the amount of cataract, you must uh, try to investigate there may be other causes of vision loss. Uh, very often it is uh, retinal pathology. But if before we all jump into OCT and do an OCT, you can do a 90 or a 78 diopter examination. And then to uh, help us make further uh, conclusions, we can do an OCT. But never forget that every patient of cataract probably doesn't have the uh, best outcome if you don't do a complete thorough examination. So the next talk uh, will be by Dr. Chaitra uh, Jaydev. She'll be talking on OCT angiography pearls and pitfalls. So this is a new technology. Many of us may not have OCTA, but just have access to OCT. So in which cases would we like to have an OCTA rather than OCT? Chaitra. Yeah. Thank you, Raja, for having me as part of your uh, course. 
I'll be talking uh, briefly on Okta, Pearls and Pitfalls. We're all still learning this uh, technology, though we've used it now for the past uh, three to four years uh, because it is difficult to interpret. There are a whole lot of reasons why uh, Okta has not replaced angiography, why there are certain cases we it is beneficial over angiography, the dye-based one. So pearls and pitfalls, so initially how I will cover it is we'll uh, demonstrate few cases when Okta has actually helped us. And the pitfalls a lot of us already know, so I'll cover that very briefly. So no financial disclosures. Uh, we do have a lot of patients in whom we are wary of doing a dye-based angiography, maybe a patient with renal disease, maybe a patient who's apprehensive of an injection, maybe somebody who's had a reaction before. So they may not want to do it. And simply because you want to do it very often, you may not want to do the angiography. So, but you still have some subtle lesions where you want to detect and ensure that there is no neovascularization or something else that will change your treatment. So that's when, uh, you know, you do need a solution and uh, Okta seems to be the way forward now. We've seen a very rapid evolution from OCT to OCTA. Uh, fast image acquisition and better resolution has allowed it to the stage where we've reached now, uh, swept source OCT, and uh, which has over a lakh uh, A scans uh, per second. Uh, this is not only limited by uh, now camera reading rates, you also can achieve faster acquisition speeds now. So it is definitely uh, moved forward and we know now that uh, retina practice is incomplete without having an OCT and I'm not sure when the time will come where even Okta is going to get that same place. So yes, uh, we have it and what we've used at our uh, institute has been the OptiView, the Avanti from around uh, 2013 to 14 we've been using this device. Of course, it's got up upgraded and we're able to, uh, you know, better imaging right now. So why has this uh, transition happened is because it's uh, basically non-invasive and therefore no repeatable. You want to do it three times a day or three times a week, it's still possible. And if you don't take a print, you hardly are, uh, you know, adding to the extra cost. And no dye is needed as a contrast agent here. So we have several Octa devices. You have the Topcon, the swept source device. You have the... OptoView or the AngioView, which we are now using. Then you have the uh, prototype Spectralis uh, OCT2. We have this as well, but not too much experience. And then you have the Zeiss uh, Cirrus uh, 5000, and you also have the Zeiss Elite, the Plex Elite, which I will uh, talk about uh, briefly as well. That is the one that is giving us the widest scans. And then you have the AngioScan by Nidec. Uh, you also have one more, uh, which is uh, Poland-based, I think, Octopol, Octopol. Mirante also. So, so these are some more that have now come. So there are different principles and this is all uh, theory, so I'm not going to go into it. If you just Google each one of the devices, it'll tell you on the different principles. Uh, but the most important thing here is that it uses motion as the dye. That's the simple uh, difference between a dye-based angiography and the octa, wherein you're just picking up only motion as the uh, uh, RBC's uh, motion. So if you can see here in the small video, it's a single scan uh, simplicity, it doesn't take too long. You detect the red blood cells with sequential OCT B scans and it's performed at the same location up to four times. So you see the RBC movement there, whether it's there or not there. And then you collate the information and based on the properties of the light reflected, you identify blood flow. So it's as simple as that. But the most important thing that Okta has given us over an angiography is segmentation. You are able to see the superficial capillary, the deep capillary, the outer retina, and the choriocapillaries. So what you're getting is the actual flame placement of the lesion. You're actually able to tell where the depth is of any particular lesion, which you were not able to do with angiography. So uh, just going to run through these slides. This is how the superficial uh, plexus looks and how the entire morphology of the blood vessels are is that uh, it has a centripetal pattern around the foveal avascular zone. And then you have the deep plexus wherein the pattern is more closely knit and uh, distributed again around the FAZ. And then you have the outer retina which normally does not show any vascular plexus. It covers from the deep outer nuclear layer to the external limiting. And then finally you have the choriocapillaris layer which has a very coarse structure. So this is basic as far as the four different layers go and this is how your printout would look unless you do some amount of manual segmentation. Important again difference from angiography dye based is that you have angioanalytics or you can quantify all of these parameters that you're seeing on the Okta. This is particularly seen in the OptoView. All the devices have some or the other sort of uh, quantification. This is the software in um, angioView. 
So it can give you uh, the density, it can give you the non-flow, it can generate the flow density map as well and all of it is color coding for easy understanding. So this is the uh, Vista that is I think on the uh, TopCon device as well. This is also quantitative. So this is how you get a flow density map. You're able to quantify and again the flow area, uh, the area is calculated by the device itself on the software. You can pick up the non-flow area. So these are things that will basically help you plan your treatment, whether it's going to be worthwhile or not. So going into some of the conditions, let's just do uh, the major ones going into AMD. It's a practical approach because you can monitor the neovascularization very well and again on the follow-up. It provides a direct morphological identification of the pathological microvascular lesions that are associated with almost all the subtypes of neovascular AMD. So this is how if you can see here uh, uh, the lesion here, you can see the extent even on the on fast imaging. Most of us tend to in ignore the on fast images but they are also quite good. And if you can see on the last scan there, uh, you can see the neovascularization and the membrane very well delineated. So here you can basically, the flow index is a parameter between 0 and 1 that is proportional to the density of the blood vessels and also the velocity of the blood flow in the uh, neovascular region. So some of the case example, this is a dry MD, a drusenoid PADs are seen quite well uh, on the octa as well. We always wonder how they are visible but they are seen. And then you, this is how it is visualized. You can see the dark areas which is through the PED itself because obviously there is no flow there. You have geographic atrophy uh, which is very well delineated, maybe not as well on the uh, dye-based angiography because of the leakage. You can actually see the uh, maturation of the blood vessels here in the atrophic stage. Then the, let me go back, so you have the different types of uh, CNV classification on the octa itself. You have the type 1, the type 2 and the type 3. Uh, and the different layers of the octa itself which uh, delineates these uh, membranes. This is by the Spade group and importantly you can on the swept source identify the diff two different types of the CNVMs itself where you here you can see the type 1 and the type 2. Then scarred CNVMs also you can quantify it, you can see the extent of the atrophy, uh, prognostification becomes very useful. You can also on the onfa see a larger extent. So like I was mentioning, the onfa is also quite important. It might look smaller on your octa, but on the onfa image, the extent of the atrophy is much larger. This is very beneficial, especially when you're showing your patient the response to treatment. This is one patient where the membrane was visible, and this is just one week later. You can actually see shrinkage of the mesh, you know, entire uh, mesh of the neovascularization, and this is at one month. So serially, you can follow up these patients. And you can also again calculate the area and the blood flow through these areas. The vessel area also can be quantified. So these are the typical changes in the vasculature that you see post injection. You can see how the membrane is uh, shrinking at four weeks follow up. This is again another uh, report that we published where we looked at the area of the membrane and how it's shrinking. PCV, uh, we were skeptical before whether we were actually able to pick up the polyps, but the BVNs are seen quite well. Sometimes if you're lucky, the polyps can be picked up as well. and uh, I think uh, Dr. Uh, Munna has been doing a lot of work on PCV and she says now she can even pick up the polyps on Octa. So there it's visible very well and the polyps are seen. And this is another example where we had a coexisting uh, CSCR and a, a PCV in the same patient. You had a peripapillary C in, uh, PCV which again we were able to pick up as a darker area surrounded by a brighter area and the BVN also was well appreciated. So I think it's become quite useful. And then this is again different patterns and activities of uh, CNVs that you can see on Okta itself. This is a good publication again. Uh, you can see pattern one, two, three based on the shape, the branching, the presence of anastomosis and loops, and also the morphology of the vessels termini, presence of a perilational hypo uh, intense halo as well. So some of the salient observations from this paper was, you see a distinct vascular pattern at at the level of the choroid and also of the outer retina. Outer retina definitely we should look for during segmentation. You can see irregular dilated and tortuous vessels and also vessels regress both in caliper and intensity immediately post injection and a serial follow up shows a further narrowing of these vessels. In DME we are able to detect diabetic retinopathy uh, even without uh, actually clinical evidence of edema or on the OCT edema as well because you can see the FAZ is altered much before clinical changes. This is superficial and the deep plexus where we were able to actually image the FAZ very, very well. You are able to see micro aneurysms as well uh, across these different layers. Uh, this was the contour map grading across the uh, different uh, severities, mild, moderate and uh, severe and PDR. We were able to 
uh, publish this. Uh, response to DME, important is that more microaneurysms, larger the FAC and lower the flow vascular index shows poorer response to treatment. So this is a paper by Lee et al. in 2016. Here this is how you see an altered FAC on the superficial and deep capillary plexus and the corresponding onfas also shows the same. This was an important uh, correlation between the OPL and the DCP itself, wherein you showed that an irregular uh, disrupted OPL and a DCP correlate and also intraretinal cysts communicate between the inner and outer nuclear layer the corresponds to a non-flow area. I just take a minute, uh, Raja, to summarize. Sure. Thank you. So, MACTEL, I just want to tell you that uh, it is not always uh, possible clinically to differentiate if there is a, a neovascularization, but this we were able to show on the octa only where we picked up the neovascularization and uh, post-treatment with anti-VEGF, even this patient with MACTEL responded. This is an important sign that you can see on uh, Octa, which shows retinochoroidal anastomosis in patients with MACTEL. CRAO published just post uh, paracentesis, we were able to show that there is a reperfusion. Uh, patient's visual acuity obviously depends on this, so maybe we, it's a good worthwhile tool. High myopia, again, because of the altered, uh, this patient had altered vision, but no obvious membrane, not willing for FA, she was expecting a baby, but just Octa picked up the membrane post injection, you can see uh, good uh, resolution of the membrane regression. Our group has also showed that octa can be used in infants and this is where we showed that uh, there was even uh, deep layers showed neovascularization which uh, regressed post laser. So uh, coming to the pitfalls now, artifacts, you have uh, motion and blinking artifacts, you have projection artifacts, you have shadowing, you have masking, segmentation difficulties, all of them are there. But we were able to uh, overcome them by doing a lot of manual segmentation and you have uh, these uh, uh, you know, artifacts correction uh, uh, possibilities also. So there is uh, difficulties and limitations, but recent advances I think have shown that we are able to get much larger images using the Plex Elite, and this is uh, one of them by Phil uh, Rosenfield. And uh, comparison, I think uh, Dr. Anand will be talking more on the angiography. So to conclude, it has helped us and it is the way forward, and I think we have to just keep persisting. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chaitra. Uh, if anyone from the audience has any questions, can please come up to the mic. But uh, Chaitra, so how important is it for a general ophthalmologist to have uh, OCT angiography in their practice given the cost? Um, the OCT which is there, probably many more people have just a regular OCT than Octa. So are there uh, any s cases where you feel that uh, you really need uh, OCT angiography over OCT and what percentage of your cases can be managed by just a regular OCT? Okay, so to answer your first question, no, not every practitioner needs to have an octa. Right now I would still say it's a luxury because it's expensive but the way forward is if you're upgrading your OCT machine, you might as well take it with the octa because all of them now do come with an octa. So when, at the time of upgrading, I think it would make sense to take the Octa because they do keep upgrading their software and their analysis. So you will get, get the benefit of this. Coming to the, your second question, which percentage of your patients do you depend only on Octa? At best, it's an ancillary tool now. But if I'm depending only on Octa, it would be for those patients who cannot undergo an angiography, dye-based angiography. And second is some cases like I just showed you, patients with myop, and you cannot either pick it up on clinical or angiography, we are able to pick up the membranes only on octa. So that those are very important points that some diseases for retina specialists, we do rely on octa, uh, but given the pitfalls also, and also many of the cases in terms of decision making for treatment from the patient's perspective, OCT is probably enough in most cases. So at this time, uh, OCT probably is still the workhorse. Thank you very much, Chaitra. Our next speaker is Dr. Anand Rajendran, who will be yeah, please. What is the CV profile of giving an anti-VEGF in uh, pregnancy? Because uh, there are like uh, many ethical issues for regarding this. And the second thing is that, you know, like uh, Dr. Chitra, she wrote, she wrote uh, very good about the myope. So in a subclinical CNVM, like, and you can call it like, which you're not able to see clinically, but you're seeing it on the investigation modality. Would you subject that patient to still the treatment or still will you observe for some time? Because myopic senians, you know, they have a better prognosis and uh, some of the patient do resolve on its own even without treatment. So in, for the first question, probably it's not related to our talk. Maybe you can take the second question. But the first question of anti-VEGF in pregnancy, it's, I mean, it's a totally unknown territory. 
to be safe on uh, from your medical legal perspective as well as from the actual point of view of any teratogenesis definitely not uh, prescribed in the first trimester for sure but even in the second and third trimester you must avoid it at all costs because of unknown reasons especially if it's a disease which can be treated by steroids if it's let's say diabetic macular edema or some inflammation you can always use uh, intravitreal steroids or even systemic if it's required but anti vegf let's say if it's only choroidal neovascularization then it becomes a difficult choice at this point of time i mean uh, transpupillary thermotherapy may be one safe option where you don't have to do anything including vertiporphin injection you, you are not sure but in it's just that cnvms where you have this big dilemma it should be avoided at all costs in the first trimester at least yes so so we are uh, avoiding anti vegf in the first trimester but considering that you are also giving anti vegf for uh, you know infants now so many of them with uh, rop they have done a trial to show that it is safe but that does not prove pre uh, is proof enough that you can give it uh, intrauterine so second uh, question that you asked uh, if i see a membrane will i treat on octa yes okay most of these patients myops will come to you so early in the disease that you give them much better prognosis and as seen on the octa the membrane is responding that means there is activity there right if the membrane had not responded you could have probably just watched the patient but just post treatment within a couple of weeks itself you have seen that the membrane is shrinking and the patient is so much better symptomatically you see high uh, myops already have you know poor vision and even this small membrane this is a young girl she's around like uh, some 26 28 if you can't give them good enough uh, central vision then i think it's uh, it's just not fair so we do treat it's not only myops a lot of other cnvms also that we've probably not picked on angiography but there is a confirmed membrane on octa we are treating so the the point you made of myopic cnvms natural history is good in terms of uh, the number of injections the required and the naturally the scarring which happens yeah that's good compared to let's say armd where you have to keep on giving injections second year third year myopic cnvms you treat them they may go away in three injections you don't treat treat them in three months they scar down but at a cost of vision loss you don't want vision loss in a myop to be compared with an armd cnvm and 618 is good enough for a high myop no so you still have to treat myopic cnvm aggressively and try try to get the best possible visual outcome for those patients too so now i request dr anand rajendran to talk about fundus floris in angiography most of us have reduced our fa in our practice but uh, there may be some indications where it's absolutely useful over to you anand yeah thanks raja and uh, it's nice that aos has uh, had the session here i think ffa is something which we talk less and less about nowadays and uh, there's therefore the debate whether it's outdated or renovated technology So FFA is this, you know, halo investigation. Is the light really going out on it? Uh, is it an investigation of diminishing value? Yes, it is invasive. There is potential to harm. It is time-consuming, and as uh, Chaitra just uh, elaborated, OCT angiography is becoming all-pervading. And with time, as uh, you know, uh, uh, techniques develop and uh, technology gets refined, it will encroach on that space of uh, fluorescent angiography. Well, the fl uh, as well advantages of fluorescent angiography still hold. It does portray function. it shows leo, uh, leakage from neovascularization which oct angiography simply cannot and it does highlight non perfusion also and its new author which i'll be talking in the latter segment of my talk mm -hmm. wide field angiography mm -hmm. is finding relevance in today's uh, new world so these were the preferred practice patterns that american Af academy of ophthalmology put out specifically to answer this particular question about the relevance of uh, fluorescein angiography in the most prob probably the most common indication sure. diabetic retinopathy So they say to guide laser treatment for CSME mm -hmm. to evaluate mm -hmm. unexplained visual loss, which is very important. To identify suspected but clinically obscure retinal neovascularization, sometimes obfuscated by a bit of hemorrhage. These are the usual indications. It may be used occasionally in identifying areas of vitreous macular attraction. This I particularly don't really agree with. To rule out other causes of macular swelling, to identify large areas of capillary non-perfusion, to evaluate patients with difficult and/or questionable examinations with DME. where it is never indicated is to screen patients with minimal or no uh, diabetic retinopathy so uh, then uh, ico also has given guidelines very clear guidelines where it says fluorescein angiography is not required to diagnose diabetic retinopathy proliferative dr or dme all of which are diagnosed by means of a fundus examination so the boundaries are pretty clear 
Floor and angiography can be used, can be, okay, as a guide to evaluate retinal non-perfusion area, presence of retinal revascularization, microaneurysm of maxillary capillary non-perfusion in DMA. Now, uh, ICO with Vision 2020 uh, segment in India gave these guidelines which we have uh, taken up in a document which was prepared by these two uh, agencies. And again, they kind of reflected the same thing, that they not needed to diagnose DR, PDR, DME, et cetera, which are all clinical uh, examinations. So FA can be used for diagnosing DME as a means of evaluating cause of unexplained decreased superficial equity and so on. So where do we really use it more commonly? It's FFA is a great tool to look at macular ischemia, especially when to confirm or diagnose. To confirm, for example, in a case like this where you think clinically that there is going to be macular ischemia with that sclerosis vessel and fluorescent angiography proves that or in a case where you suspect it when the uh, visual equity and the clinical picture don't really match up. So in that case, you can again detect fluorescent angiography with an enlarged FAG as you see here. So also to diagnose cases of PDR where the NV is very, uh, you know, uh, minimal and you're not very sure as in this case, okay? Also to rule it out in, in, in the fellow eye of these very same patients. So in, uh, in other cases, in atypical cases of diabetic retinal pain, this patient on first look, one might think it's like moderate NPDR, hardly any background changes. But if you look carefully, there's these sclerosis vessels, which are a giveaway clinically. And this is actually fluorescent angiography shows that it's a high-risk PDR. Another case, which again, to the casual untrained eye, might be uh, moderate NPDR, if you look just at the posterior fold, but fluorescent angiography in the periphery shows this to be a case of peripheral PDR. Also, asymmetric diabetic retinopathy, right eye you have vitreous hemorrhage again a casual observer may think this is moderate NPDR they're dealing with but if you look very carefully there's very fine neovascularization you're not very sure and fluorescent angiography shows that this eye also has proliferative diabetic retinopathy so so many places where you know uh, fluorescent angiography still has a place where as we talked about earlier in cases of a dubious clinical listing anterior ischemic optic neuropathy and diabetic papillopathy can look a little similar diabetic papillopathy as we know Fluorescent angiography tells us very clearly that, you know, with time, with resolution, with uh, greater adaptive uh, control of uh, the hyperglycemia, it can spontaneously resolve as shown here with these two fluorescent angiograms. Another case where what looks like choroiditis, again, on first up, and uh, or some yellowish flocculent material in the inferior part is a case of CSCR, and this leak distortion shows that it's a case, and this is distortion because of the subretinal fibrin. Another case which I like showing, which I've shown quite often, it's kind of bizarre picture. Uh, <coughs> when you look to do the fluorescent angiogram, you see this multi-pronged RPA rip with transmitted fluorescence, and then you see the leaks coming up, and then you have a clue as to what it is. It's a kind of a white lizard in the eye, and the thing is flaming up, and this is actually an atypical CSR with multi-pronged complex RPA rip, massive subretinal fibrin, and inferior bullet pallid. So it's really the fluorescent angiography which tells you here. The OCT, of course, also adds to that with the uh, at different levels showing the uh, subretinal fibrin which is evacuated, the RP discontinuity and the foveal uh, SRS there. So this treated with uh, PPP. Another patient where again temporarily there's a lot of yellowish material, you might think this patient was actually treated for choroiditis, you know, without doing an angiogram based on what we thought. There was inferior exudative RD and inferiorly there was this neovascularization, what looks like choroiditic uh, uh, material uh, exudates, but there's actually subretinal precipitates in another area. Again, you see uh, precipitates which line up near the vessels which look like vasculitis, again, a bit of neovascularization. So it is really fluorescent angiography which tells us that in the posterior fold, those leaks are there and they're fairly typical of CSCR. In the periphery, ne uh, neovascularization and the non-perfusion is shown. So this was chronic CSCR which rarely can present like this with uh, neovascularization, neovascularization cells. This patient even had the NVI and we treated the patient with PPP to the leaking spots in the vasculum. Uh, OCT showed the chronic uh, fluid there and the static edema. So CSR can sometimes coexist with PP. This we're beginning to understand more uh, as we look at the pachycoroid spectrum in the case of my friend George, where fluorescent angiography shows a uh, leak and ICG angiography shows the polyp in the same patient. So they can coexist. So here again, angiography plays a great role. Again, to the casual eye, this patient would look like a foveal cyst, a large cyst out there, but it's actually a PD with epical erosion of the RP material and what you see is the, on the fluorescent angiogram early and late phase that window defect uh, lightening up and which we published sometime there earlier. Vasculitis, there are several indications. I can't cover everything. There's, there's a case of Bezos where you have typical disc leakage and the capillary burning, which you see also in both eyes. Uh, myopic CNN, we were talking uh, just to add to that. So there's an active scarred CNN in one eye, an active CNN. So just to add to what you were saying, you know, uh, your question as to whether we should treat. If you don't treat, left eye can go in and become like the right eye. So as a, as a rule, any CNVM, forget about etiology, CNVM in the eye is a potentially blind eye. 
So you have to treat, whether you detect it by flow chain angiography, octa, whatever. PNBM has to be treated and early with antibiotic. So this was the flow chain angiography, so the leukemia, and it was a few days. FEVR, was, was the disease was the periphery and so see fold. Uh, flow chain angiogram shows beautifully the peripheral avascular zone in this area, the palisading, and uh, uh, the new vessels also. ROP, this is another place where flow chain angiography, in fact, angioscopy has a role to play. You see very aggressive posterior ROP, you see this bilateral avascular, you see these angry looking vessels, complete avascularity in the periphery, and flow chain angiography delineates it so much better. And you see there's engorged vessels, and in the right eye, you see with uh, a post treatment two weeks later, those that engorged look is gone, and the vessels are beginning to spread out, and you track that very well with the flow chain angiogram, and it moves to the, in the left, in the uh, this is complete montage of the right eye, where you see from presentation to two weeks, post Avaskin has 12 weeks and 24 weeks. Same thing in the left eye. Optos, uh, this is now the second part of my talk, the renovated technology brings with it the capacity to do ultra-wide angiography. It uses a confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscope technology. Ellipsoid mirrors mir mir used contains two focal points. The laser passes, is passed through the first focal point, the second focal point is virtually placed on the iris, giving us a uh, iris plane, giving us a 200 degree wide view of the retina. It uses two lasers, the green laser, because of the lesser wavelengths can image anterior structures, the red laser, greater wavelength, can create deep and uh, choroidal structures. So with angio, it, it can, uh, it has the capacity to image 3.2 times more retinal area on photography, and 3.9 times area more on uh, angiography compared to the standard seven field photographs. So all this is better because you can miss, you, you now have the capacity to image lesions that you might have missed with standard in a montage. So just targeted retinal photocoagulation can be done. As you can see here, the uh, ultrawide field shows clearly the areas that have been missed and not lasered and show that. Uh, it can show up what diabetic retinopathy can be, a disease of the periphery or the posterior, as in seen in two different cases. This is wild field does a great job in highlighting that. We've seen BRVOs that can show all the areas of an, a non-perfusion, more than what you would expect on a standard uh, flow chain angiogram. Vasculitis, as I showed earlier, you have one case here with activity and you can see the periphery and another case where you just have peripheral ischemia there. Another case is peels, where again, if this is partially lasered, you can clearly show you lasers where it's still uh, not lasered, where you can put in some more laser and then when no laser was added, you can see the quiescence of the uh, um, activity of the vasculitis. FEVR, again, so this shows beautifully in one shot. You remember the previous uh, standard, the thing we had multiple pictures, but here in one shot, you can show the nephoral drag, the exudation, the avascular retina, and uh, temporal NDE. Coats disease, again, shows you the typical uh, 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 disease uh, pathology on the angiogram and the non-perfusion areas. Hemangioblastomas are shown in one beautiful shot, all those areas, multiple hemangioblastomas in the VH disease that it is, and uh, it shows it light enough. So, in summary, FFA, while has diminishing indications with the advent of dialless non-invasive OCT angiography, still retains value addition in terms of highlighting, as I mentioned earlier, leakage and functional uh, uh, leakage because of new vascularization, peripheral ischemia. Yes, OCT is improving year on year and we're seeing improvement in, and it's also becoming wide field, but it today still has uh, is yet to match conventional ultra wide field range. Atypical presentations of diseases as I've highlighted can be uh, beautifully explained with flow chain angiography and the new ultra, ultra wide field of flow chain angiography with its innovations is setting a new standard in imaging, is uncovering pathology that we clinically may or may not suspect and is helping us uh, put in effective therapy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anand. Uh, overall, what he has highlighted is that in peripheral retinal pathology, at this point of time at least, our OCT angiography cannot be uh, imaging the extreme periphery. So you still need at least uh, if you have ultra wide field angiography or even wide field with different uh, gazes, you can check the periphery. The other thing is that uh, at this time in CSR at least when you have to treat with laser or even PDT, you need to check the leakage points which you need to target with laser. So that OCT angiography cannot help at this point of time because it can only track the motion in the blood vessels. But any outer blood retinal barrier leakage which is there can be picked up only by fluorescein or ICG angiography. So these are some of the important differences and we must know that uh, so FA still has a role. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and in UVI it is also, uh, you I mean OCT just cannot pick up the early hypo, late hypo, or whatever uh, features you need to look at, choroiditis or white dots. Uh, or weak case, uh, late stippled hyperfluorescence you find in scleritis. 
So those are things which uh, OCT angiography cannot uh, actually help at this point of time. Uh, so thank you very much, thank Anand. Uh, I now invite uh, Dr. Giridhar, our past president of VRSI, to give uh, his talk on ICG angiography. Thank you, Raja, and thank you for including me in this uh, program. Before I start, I thought I'll just ask, how many of you do ICG? Yeah. Okay, that's one person who does the ICG. <laughs> that itself answers the question. So, I mean, it's a very interesting talk. Is it more spoken than done? And so what I'm going to tell you in the next eight to 10 minutes is, uh, in we have been doing ICG for 15 years now, more than 15 years. We started with a camera-based system. Now we have the SLO system, and uh, uh, so I thought that let, I thought I mean I, I thought that let me go into history as to what uh, what sort of clinical situations where ICG angiogram. Now you have multimodal imaging, you have fluorescein, you have ICG, you have OCT, and many diseases today the SD OCT give, acts as a very good biomarker to reach a diagnosis for many, many diseases. So invasive angiography probably, you know, is more for understanding the vascular status like fluorescein angiography in diabetic retinopathy. But in macular disease, I think OCT has really made a remarkable change as far as uh, we are able to reach a diagnosis, etiological diagnosis as far as the disease is concerned. So there are two reasons. One is the cost and the utility. Probably it's useful in centers where they have a high volume medical written up practice where they see a large number of patients so they need uh, all the gadgets so that they make a proper diagnosis and treatment. The cost is always a factor as far as ICG angiography is concerned because it, I think it adds on another 15, 20 lakhs as far as the imaging system is concerned. So in our center, mainly what are the two important indications? One is the wet age-related macular degeneration and the other is the pachychoroid spectrum. These are the two situations where we do the ICG angiogram. So I just thought that let me see as to how much of ICG do we do in a year. Surprisingly, in 2019, we did less ICG angiogram than what we did in the previous two years. So that has been a little drop, although the number of patients probably are more or less the same. So the reason is, as I told you, SD OCT is giving us a lot of biomarkers to tell us to reach an etiological diagnosis, which probably was not possible earlier. And repeat ICG angiograms probably have decreased a lot because earlier we used to do a lot of repeat ICG angiograms after treatment just to see whether, for example, in a polypoidal disease, you would give a PDT, and after PDT, we repeat the ICG to see whether there's a total closure, etc. So I'll be showing you a few cases as to situations where probably an ICG angiogram is very, very useful. This case number one, this is a 64-year-old gentleman who actually had a history of central serous chorioretinopathy, multiple attacks, who later came to me with a defective vision in the right eye. If you see the right eye, he has got a serous macular detachment and he has got these nice something what we nowadays call as patchy drusen, where focal areas of RPE changes. And the left eye also has got what we call uh, as a pachychoroid pigment epitheliopathy. You see all these drusenoid changes in the parafovial area. The right eye has got a serous macular detachment, very classic to tell you that it is a central serous chorioretinopathy. But when you do the OCT, you must always do the OCT in the full macular cube. And you see this small area of RP elevation, what we call as the double layer sign now, telling us that probably this is not a classic case of a central serous chorioretinopathy. The left eye, of course, is dry, but then he has got a typical PPE picture. So if you look at the autofluorescence again, it looks like a central serous chorioretinopathy. You can see this area of uh, increased hyperautofluorescence here inferiorly. And therefore, an ICG angiogram was done, basically because the in o SD OCT told us that this probably is a case of a neovascular membrane under the retinal pigment epithelium. And if you see the ICG angiogram, you can see the polypoidal disease. 
We can see this in a huge network of vessels with a polypoid in each case. Therefore, this is a type 1 neovascular membrane, which is beautifully diagnosed by ICG angiogram. Today, if you have the octa, probably you can diagnose it, but octa, again, is a heavy investment. So with an ICG angiogram, you are able to diagnose it. If you see the fluorescein angiography in the same patient, you don't see the network at all. You see some areas of increased or, uh, hyperfluorescence, but then the ICG angiogram shows you the network, and if you pass the OCT through that, you can see this polypoidal change also. Therefore, ICG angiogram in this particular patient was very useful to reach a diagnosis of a type 1 neovascular membrane. This is the second case which I want to show you. The left eye has got very poor vision with a lot of lipid in the retina, and the right eye had a defective vision. This patient also, you can see here, there's a serous macular detachment and a slight elevation of the retinal pigment epithelium. Here also, the autofluorescence is more suggestive of a central serous chorioretinopathy, the descending tract in the left eye. But then the OCT and the ICG angiogram tells you that this is not a case of a, a, a CS here, but you can see these, again, a huge network here right in the center. You can see the network in a larger measure. Unfortunately, the light in the halls are really disturbing the images. You see a large network here, which is diagnosed by ICG angiogram. ICG angiogram becomes necessary, especially if you want to do a photodynamic therapy, because you need the size of the lesion, and the size of the lesion cannot be estimated using the STOCT. It's very difficult. So if you want to actually estimate the correct size of the disease, you can see here in this picture, this is a network ending in small polypoidal dilatation. Therefore, this is again another clinical situation where ICG angiogram was very useful to reach a diagnosis and also plan the treatment, especially if you're planning photodynamic therapy. Now, this is a patient who was referred to me as a circinate maculopathy. You can see so much of lipid here. Of course, people like us, me, Raja, and all, when we look at such a picture, we practically know what we are dealing with, especially when you see this orangish elevation here. So here also, you can see the OCT is diagnostic. Once you see this OCT today, you know you're dealing, you have got a serous macular detachment, you have this elevation here, you have this large PD, you're dealing with a polypoidal disease. You don't need to do an ICG angiogram to reach a diagnosis in such a situation, especially if you're doing anti vegf treatment. However, in our center, we did the ICG angiogram. But then this is a clinical situation where probably you may be doing only an anti of injection because you have such a large network with a very poor visual acuity. You're not going to do any invasive treatment like PDT at all. So you're going to treat these patients with injection. Probably in this situation, without an ICG, you can start the treatment and you know that this is a case of polypoidal disease and you can treat the patient accordingly. This is an, a, very, a very interesting case. This is a patient, again, and a very old patient of mine, one eye, very poor vision, loss for follow-up. She came to me with defective vision in the left eye. You can see the left eye, now the earlier OCT, long time back in July 2013, and the, and the left eye, how it was. And later, when she came to us with a recent onset of defective vision, you can see the small subretinal hemorrhage and a small and la large amount of fluid here in the macula. And this is a very characteristic finding in SDOCT again. Of course, the SDOCT gives us a clear indication what possibly is the etiology as far as this disease is concerned. For a general medical retina specialist, probably all of them form, fall under the category of a wet age related macular degeneration. But from a very specialized point of view, you want to know whether it is a polypoidal disease, whether it's a type 1 CNVM, whether it's a RAP, retinal angiomatosis proliferation, because these are all things that tell us, prognosticate the patient as well as talking to the patient, telling the patient what exactly is going to be the se sequence of events over the next few months. So if you see the ICG angiogram, it's very diagnostic. You can see the small area of hyperautofluorescence that is coming right in the center of the pigment epithelial detachment, which is continuously increasing. You can see here it has increased so much more. This is a typical case of a retinal angiomatosis proliferation where we see a hyperfluorescence uh, or a hypercyanescence, which is continuously increasing through the angiogram right in the center of the pigment epithelial detachment. In, an, uh, in the fluorescein angiogram, you just see a leakage at the edge of the retinal pigment epithelial detachment, but if you see the ICG angiogram, it is diagnostic. And if you pass the OCT through that, you can see this particular discontinuity of the retinal pigment epithelium where you are having the growth, the intraretinal thing is entering into the subretinal space. This is very diagnostic as far as ICG angiogram is concerned. My last slide, this is on the left, is the normal ICG angiogram where you see the tapering of the 
uh, choroidal vessels as you reach the fovea. And this is a pachychoroid disease where you see these large dilated vessels right in the center of the fovea. This is very diagnostic of a pachychoroid spectrum, which again can only be diagnosed or is estimated with the <coughs> ICD angiogram, especially if you want to do a PDT treatment in some of these cases. My last case here, this is a patient with a long-standing serous macular detachment. Also, uh, FFA did not show any leak. I, we did an ICD angiogram, and you can see here a focal area of dilatation, or whether it's a small area of neovascularization, we do not know. But then you can make, oh, this can again be diagnosed only by ICD angiogram in a patient with a chronic central serous chorioretinopathy like disease where the fluid doesn't go at all. When you see these focal areas, you can just treat them with a little bit of a PDT, which is very effective. You can see the IC OCT going through that particular area. You see the irregularity of the retinal pigment epithelium also. So I have shown you a spectrum of cases where the ICD angiogram was useful to reach a diagnosis and also probably helpful to a certain extent to reach the treatment. So to ask, answer the question as to is it more spoken than done, probably in centers where, you know, you have a large volume of patients with a multiple diseases, yes, ICG probably even today is quite a useful uh, investigative modality, especially if you want to do a PDT, I think it is a must because the size of the lesion cannot be estimated otherwise. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Giridhar, for this excellent presentation. Uh, do you think that uh, in the ICG that w there is a drop in your institute you mentioned, is it because only of the re-ICG which you are not doing more often at this time or is I it even I the new case? I don't know. I just got this data day for yesterday because there's a sudden idea that struck me <laughs> just before I left my place to uh, reach here. So why not we just get a statistics as to how many cases because I wanted, I asked him whether we have done any Indian survey. I mean, to find out how many of the ophthalmologists or retina specialists in India are doing ICD angiogram. I, unfortunately, we do not have that data. A couple of, in the United States, see what we do, we follow the West, unfortunately. Now, in the United States, they don't do ICG because it's not uh, reimbursed by the insurance. So they don't do ICG. Whereas, you know, that, that's the reason. It's not because it's not helpful, but then that's the reason why it's not done. So the drop, I like to go back and study as to why that was yeah, the problem. No, I really don't know. But I personally feel it's one of the reasons of the repeat ICD. That's still useful. But the other survey which I, we actually did was among all the new uh, VR uh, fellows uh, who have just completed. We asked them how many of them had an exposure to ICD angiography. Uh, almost more than 50% of them had mentioned that they have uh, experienced uh, ICG angiography interpretation during their fellowship. Probably because a lot of fellowships are done at Shankar Netral, LV Prasad and Arvind. So, but at least a lot of retina fellows who are completing their fellowship have uh, experience with ICG. It's just that in the practice, probably they're doing a lot less. But then again, there are some key patients where you must keep in mind that this patient may need ICG in the future, like polypodal choroidal vasculopathy, which is uh, more uh, common in India. These are patients where you may have to do photodynamic therapy later on. So these are cases where you may have to prime them from the beginning and uh, be aware that these patients may need ICG angiography later on. So uh, the next speaker, Dr. Avantika Dogra, uh, my colleague, uh, could not attend for some reasons. Uh, I request Dr. Giridhar to uh, for one talk and then, yeah. So I request him to be here uh, for the conclusion of the uh, session. I'll be talking on uh, autofluorescence. I'll be talking on autofluorescence. Uh, we all have now, it's readily available in all cameras. Uh, but uh, in general, there, there are some indications where it is extremely useful, but most of the time it's just an additional feature like we have so many smartphones now, but we rarely use most of the features. We just use it for some of the features are smartphones. But what are the cases where autofluorescence can be extremely useful? So autofluorescence comes from the stimulated em emission from lipofusin and melanolipofusin. So 
Lipofusion is the most important pigment from which we as retina specialists are concerned uh, with autofluorescence. It is uh, accumulated in the post mitotic cell, which is basically the retinal pigment epithelium. And it consists of polyunsaturated uh, fatty acid, retinoids, and lipoproteins. And it may actually induce apoptosis. So if uh, uh, the lipofusin is accumulating in the RPE beyond what is the normal rate of accumulation, then that can induce oxidative damage to the RP, which then ultimately leads on to outer retinal damage, photoreceptor damage, and uh, this can lead to further vision loss. So the autofluorescence, which we normally look at, which is in the blue wavelength range, uh, looks at the autofluorescence from lipofusin. So autofluorescence can be done in different wavelengths. But as I said, the most important one of lipofusin, which we regularly use for our retina cases, is the 488 nanometer wavelength, which is the blue wavelength autofluorescence. There is also autofluorescence at different wavelengths. Uh, one commonly used is at 787 near the infrared range. But these are more for melanin-related uh, problems, whereas we are looking specifically in many retinal diseases related to lipofusin. So lipofusin autofluorescence at 488 nanometer, the blue wavelength, and melanin autofluorescence at 787 or near the infrared range. So there are different cameras and different protocols, different wavelengths for acquisition of uh, fundus autofluorescence. This uh, photograph here is just showing on the top picture panel, if you look at this, the right uh, or the left picture is actually of uh, 488 nanometer autofluorescence which is what we normally use for retinal diseases. And in this, if you look at carefully, the central fovea is hypoautofluorescence. That's extremely important to note for all of us as retina specialists that in 488 nanometer blue wavelength autofluorescence, the central fovea is hypo, which is normal. Whereas in a 787 nanometer autofluorescence near the infrared, the center is hyper. But again, to not confuse too much, we will be focusing from now on, all the photographs and retinal diseases will be using 488 nanometers where the central fovea should be hypo. Now this is a photograph of a 488 nanometer where the central dark hypo has been lost. It's kind of iso with the surrounding autofluorescence. This is one of the typical signs of parafoveal telangiectasia if I can go back to the previous picture, we all know that 488 nanometer excites the lipofusin, which is in the retinal pigment epithelium. So why is the central fovea normally hypoautofluorescent? Is it that the RPE is less in the fovea? Is it that lipofusin is less in the fovea? No. RP is very strong. They are taller cells actually in the fovea. They also have a lot of uh, regeneration going on. There is a lot of lipofusin in the fovea, but there is something else in the fovea, and that is xanthophyll pigment. The xanthophyll pigment right in the central macula blocks the lipofusin autofluorescence of the fovea from the RPE. So that's why the foveal xanthophyll pigment, which blocks the autofluorescence, that is the reason why the normal fovea is hypoautofluorescent. So if you have a condition where the xanthophyll itself is lost from the retina, that will now not block the autofluorescence from the RPE. So in this disease, in this case which I am showing here, there is a disease where the xanthophyll has been lost from the retinal layers and the normal RP autofluorescence is showing up as a normal autofluorescence. And this disease is parafoveal telangiectasia, type 2. This is a disease where the xanthophyll concentration in the retina is lost, and that's why you get an early kind of loss of hypoautofluorescence, a very important tool if you ever have to uh, make a diagnosis of autofluorescence and parafoveal telangiectasia in the very early stages, because in very early stages, OCT may be normal. The patient may have 6-6-N6, but they will complain of some disturbance in reading. And you see uh, probably not much of changes in the retina. Do an autofluorescence. If you do this, and if you get this autofluorescence picture, you are most likely dealing with 
parafovil telangiectasia yeah, type 2. The latest diagnostic tool which can confirm in very early stages is fluorescein angiography or OCT angiography, but if you don't have that, autofluorescence can give a good idea. What about this patient of uh, cystoid macular edema? There are some autofluorescence changes, but in practical reality in a clinic situation, autofluorescence doesn't have much of a role in cystoid macular edema management or diagnosis. What about central serous retinopathy? In a typical acute central serous retinopathy where you have a subretinal fluid, an ink blot or smokestack appearance on fluorescein angiography, here this bottom left picture is of an autofluorescence. You don't see much of a change except for the area uh, just above the fovea because of subretinal fluid accumulation, but you're not seeing any typical CSR changes of different uh, hypo and hyper autofluorescence. But if in a case of chronic central serous retinopathy, autofluorescence is extremely useful. You see this multiple patches of hyper autofluorescence and with the multiple dots of hypo. And if you actually do a, a wide angle autofluorescence, you can see the RP track, which we call the seeping of uh, fluid in these cases, chronic CSR can lead to autofluorescence changes much farther away from the fovea. What about this case of a macular hole? You can easily diagnose this with a 90D or 78D examination. OCT confirms macular hole. So why even bother about autofluorescence? This, is it a theoretical exercise? In most cases, you don't need an autofluorescence either to diagnose a uh, macular hole or even management, let's say, to do a surgery, vitrectomy with ILM peeling. But in terms of prognostication, if you have a patient who says, I don't know, I, I think my vision loss has been there for the last one year, two years, and then you are not sure even if you do the macular hole surgery, the hole may close, but the patient is going to ask, doctor, how much improvement am I going to get after even, let's say the hole closes, and uh, how much would be my improvement? And the vision at this point is six by 60. The patient says, my history is about two years of vision loss. So what are you going to do? You can do an autofluorescence. If the autofluorescence is like this, this is the left eye I had mentioned that normally the fovea is hypoautofluorescent because of xanthophyll pigment in the retina, whereas in a macular hole case, there is no retina in the center. Now you can see the very nice autofluorescence of the RP, the normal RP at the center, which is causing a bright autofluorescence. If you see a normal bright hyperautofluorescence of the RP, that means the RP is functioning normally. So if you do a surgery and the hole closes, this patient is likely to improve after the surgery. But in instead of this kind of autofluorescence, if you were to see a dark patch, then you can tell the patient probably you are unlikely to get further visual improvement after surgery, but you may still opt for surgery just to maintain the current eyesight. If the hole increases in size, the vision may drop further, but at least it's useful for prognostication. Another important indication where autofluorescence is extremely useful is macular dystrophies, heridomacular degeneration, especially vitelliform diseases, best disease, and also Stargardt's disease. So if a patient comes to the clinic and a young patient and you see only the left column of color fundus photograph, you may not be, at least to the uh, regular ophthalmologist, uh, who don't see too many dystrophies in the clinic, this may just appear to be a macular scar and you are completely uh, uh, lost as to what may be the diagnosis and uh, even the OCT is not going to pick up much, maybe in fact mislead you by a subretinal fluid. If you do an OCT in best disease, you may find a subretinal fluid kind of thing on many scans, but that doesn't mean that you start injecting these patients with Avastin and Lucentis. So if you do an autofluorescence in these cases, more informative than a fluorescein angiogram is the autofluorescence where you see the bright hyperautofluorescence in a ring-like fashion or in a spectral fashion. This confirms more or less uh, best vitelliform disease. You can do an ERG and EOG later on if you have access to it for confirmation, but autofluorescence is very typical. And don't inject these patients just because uh, there is a subretinal fluid on OCT. This is another example of Stargardt's disease, you can see a kind of macular atrophy on color fundus photograph, foveal thinning, multiple flex, but the autofluorescence uh, shows many more lesions than just a color fundus photograph. Another area of disease where autofluorescence is extremely useful is uh, uveitis, where at least in 
uh, many cases where you have hyper autofluorescence it does uh, indicate activity in these cases very useful in serpiginoid or serpiginous like choroiditis where you may have mix of cases of hypo autofluorescence which are the scarred inactive areas of lesions but wherever there is an hyper autofluorescence that indicates activity and you must continue treatment in these cases another good indication for autofluorescence in optic nerve disease is uh, differential diagnosis of uh, disc edema, optic disc edema comparing with optic disc drusen. So in autofluorescence you will definitely be able to make out the autofluorescence due to drusen. Another important indication for uh, uh, autofluorescence at this point of time although not useful in the management overall because there is no treatment for dry macular degeneration but at least uh, whenever the treatment at this point a lot of trials are going on for macular degeneration dry macular degeneration when they come up they are going to look at progression of geographic atrophy so in this case as you see here on the autofluorescence you see a dark central area and then uh, there are also other areas of macular atrophy and there are softwares which are available which can actually track the growth or expansion of the atrophic lesions as in this patient uh, at baseline the area of atrophy was much less but over one year this patient has uh, increased in terms of atrophic lesions so in summary, autofluorescence is very useful in dystrophies, uveitis, chronic CSR and dry macular degeneration, mostly from the diagnostic purpose. I just mentioned one of them, uh, macular hole where it can be used for prognostic reasons also at this point of time. However, normative database is kind of like, you don't have numbers for autofluorescence like macular edema. Yeah, it's, it's the normative database is lacking and that's, it's all qualitative at this point of time and different equipments with different wavelengths and different outputs can cause some confusion for uh, people like us uh, in terms of interpreting them. Thank you very much for your kind attention. So are there any questions right now? Komal, Kopal? The question is, uh, I have seen a series of patients, I have just recently added an OCT angiography to my practice, and there are a series of cases who have had three anti-VEGFs and have a dry OCT, but a persistent metamorphopsia. When I do an OCT angiography, I do see a vessel, and uh, it's too early for me to pick up or to decide whether this is an atrophic vessel or uh, an active uh, vessel. So OCT angiography by itself cannot show you activity. In, in all cases of CNVM, once you treat them in spite of the treatment and inactivity, at least in ARMD or the type 1, under the RP, whatever blood vessels are there, they kind of start maturing and you will see them lifelong. That choroidal neovascular membrane will persist lifelong. So OCT will pick it, but it doesn't tell you whether you need to retreat these patients. So what you need to look at for retreatment is OCT. If there is fluid on OCT, even if OCT angiography you don't have, but if there is fluid on OCT, you re-inject. But if you don't have fluid on OCT, but the OCT angiography is showing the net, there is no indication for treatment as I said because OCT, the net is going to, there, going, going to be there lifelong. But in your case specifically what you said there was a dilemma that the patient on OCT did not have any fluid but the patient had metamorphopsia. Now that is something like in case of myopic CNVM or parafoveal telangiectasia, early CNVM, you may not have much of fluid even though they have uh, disease activity and it is reactive in terms of we give a lot of importance to patient symptoms in those cases. So if you have had a patient of three injections, uh, you don't see definite fluid but if you look at all the scans, there may be one or two cysts or some area of thickening but if metamorphopsia is persisting, you can continue the injections, but up to what point is a big question. Say, let's say earlier you had fluid, now there is no fluid after three injections, but if there's still metamorphopsia, then you can give one more injection and see if it's changing. But if you have had a patient where you gave one injection and the fluid went away after the first injection, you still gave second and third injection for metamorphopsia, and now the metamorphopsia is still persisting, but there's no edema. I don't think there is any reason continuing the injection just for the sake of metamorphopsia when there's no fluid. As it may be subjective. Yes. yes. And so the comment was, as you talked about the importance of autofluorescence in uveitis, 
we have some cases where the steroids have been stopped the patient is on immunosuppression and uh, the autofluorescence uh, tells us when to stop tapering of the immunos immunosuppression because the uh, smoldering activity of diseases like VKH that becomes uh, evident on the uh, autofluorescence. Yes, so again it's multimodal or you know multi imaging or even clinical aspects so as you said oh, autofluorescence can pick up activity um, and also there for at least VKH you can look at choroidal thickness whether that's increasing, you have to restart the treatment apart from the regular clinical activity of vitreous cells and anti vitreous vessels. But yes, it's a good point that autofluorescence is very helpful in uh, UVI death. So, uh, is Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary there? Uh, keynote speaker, is he, has he uploaded? Uh, regarding the OCT angiogram for knowing the uh, new vascular network, so when you give the injections, it does regress, the OCT comes back to normal. Like, you know, there is a regression of the fluid and all of them. But for the PR and doses, when the patient comes back again for a, for the checkup and everything, the OCT still doesn't show any fluid or doesn't show any other like clinical, there's no sign of an hemorrhage either. But the, the network starts increasing in size again. So like, you know, so what would be the prognosis? Like, uh, you will say that, you know, the CMM is going to come back again with another fluid or back again. So will you still inject or you still wait for some more time? Excellent question. So I think you have been looking at your patient's uh, OCT angiograms uh, very carefully. At this point of time, the overall consensus based on data, two-year follow-up data of what we call as incipient CNVM or quiescent CNVM, where you see the n f CNVM on OCT angiography, but there's no fluid. Over two years follow-up study, what they have found is that even if patients have increasing sizes of CNVM, they may not have any fluid activity for a long time. So as a prevention of fluid accumulation, even if the OCTA net is growing, at this time the consensus is there is no need to treat them aggressively. Basically, don't inject them just because of the increase in size of the CNVM. But if there is any fluid which comes, you may have to monitor them more closely. If for regular patients of ARMD, you are calling them after three months, giving them home AMSLR, but these patients you may want to call back to your clinic even every month to do an OCT to look at the fluid on OCT, a regular OCT, not just the OCT angiography for the size of the CNV. This is at least holds true, but the study which I am talking about is for ARMD CNVM. Now, whether it's parafoveal till injectage or CNVM or myopic CNVM, whether they are increasing in size at this point of time, we don't have good data. But if the patient is patient is having symptoms of metamorphopsia in myopic or parafoveal till injectasia, yeah, we start treatment even if the OCT doesn't show any fluid. So, if he is not there, the keynote speaker, then thank you all very much uh, for coming to this instruction course. Thank you very much.